Hey everybody, so we are going to start our next unit on cognition and language and before we do that I wanted to show you this slide that shows the modules that you'll be responsible for 34, 35, and 36 and we are going to finish this unit before Christmas that way there is no stress over break for you so I want these modules by next Friday um, December 18th. Okay, so the purpose of this video today, though, we're going to save the language for next week, but we're going to start talking about cognition. And hopefully you remember from the memory unit that cognition is just another word for thinking. And it's important because psychology is a study of mental processes and behaviors, and I mean, thinking is what mental processes are. So just a quick subfield plug, um, a cognitive psychologist studies the way you think, the way you remember, the, um, how you solve problems, obstacles to problem solving, and they try and figure out how we can think better, or is there even a way to think better? If you remember from the beginning of the year when I had to do that extra credit assignment um, with Dr. Chu, you had to watch all those YouTube videos on how to study better and prepare for tests better. Dr. Chu is an example of a cognitive psychologist. He's a very famous one and very, very good in his field. So since this unit is all about thinking and problem solving, let's start off with a brain teaser. So I want you to copy this um, form of this pattern of dots on your paper. And so the problem is this. Can you connect all nine of these dots um, using only four lines and without lifting your pencil off of your paper. So you're trying to draw a line, essentially a continuous line, through all nine of these dots, but you can only switch directions four times and you cannot lift your pencil off of your paper. So we'll see if you can do it and then I'll give you the answer on how to do it at the end of this presentation. Uh, one other brain teaser that you can think about as we're going through these notes. A ball and a bat cost $1.10 total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much is the ball? I'll give that answer to you as well when we're done with the video. So the most basic building block vocabulary word you need to know about thinking is concepts. And a concept is just a way that you mentally organize information together, how you kind of categorize things. And it's really similar to the idea of schemas that we talked about in the memory unit. Um, if you remember, I gave you that list of words to remember that all dealt with sleep, but I didn't actually say sleep. But when a lot of people recalled the words, they wrote down sleep because the, all those words fit their concept or their schema of sleep. So another example, if you look at all these dogs right here, they all look a little different, but they all probably fit your concept of dogs. You walk into a shoe store, there's a bunch of different types of shoes and boots and flip-flops, and even though they look different, they still fit your concept of shoes. Or, you know, as you drive down the road, there's a lot of different things driving by you, but you all associate them with vehicles. They're all they're all the same type of category. Okay, so that's kind of where our thinking starts is with these concepts. Um, another example is right here. These are all examples of chairs. They are different, but they all probably fit your concept or your schema of chairs. Now, how do we build concepts? We build concepts um, with, that, with these things called prototypes. And so your prototype is your best example of a category. Okay, so if I say dogs, your concept or your category of dogs, just what's the first dog, the first kind of dog that pops into your brain? For a lot of people, it's the golden retriever. So maybe the golden retriever is your prototype of the category or the concept of dogs. If I say shoe, what's the first shoe that you think of? That would be your prototype. If I say vehicle, what's the first vehicle you think of? That would be your prototype. Uh, if I say bird, what type of bird do you think of? If I say college, you know, is your prototype of college community college or is it like Harvard or Yale? Um, if I say justice, you know, what is your prototype of justice? Is it when, you know, your brother or sister who did something wrong finally gets in trouble by your parents? Is it when someone who killed someone goes to jail? Like, what is it? So um, one last example, if I tell you to think about um, a boy or a man, um, all these people right here would probably fit your concept of guys, but girls, your prototype probably looks something more like this. Um, so it's different for everybody, but your prototypes help form your concepts. The problem with prototypes, though, is that they sometimes can create some fuzzy lines in our concepts. So, I mean, we obviously know that this is a bird, but if you were to tell this to like a four or five year old that thinks all birds fly, all birds are little, they might not classify this as a bird because it doesn't match with their prototype of what a bird looks like. And so therefore, they're not going to classify this bird into their concepts. Other examples is a whale, a mammal. I mean, we know whales are mammals, but if you tell that to a four or five or six year old, they might not think that because their prototype of a mammal doesn't live in the water and, and swim all day, right? Are 17 year old people children or adults? Are heart attacks, oh, heart attack symptoms. So a lot of times people think a heart attack um, symptom would be like their heart starts or their chest starts to hurt. Um, but a lot of times what 
as uh, evidence of a heart attack is if someone's shoulder starts to hurt really bad. And um, people don't think it's a heart attack because they just think it's an ache in their shoulder. And so a lot of people don't go to the hospital because these symptoms don't fit their prototype of what a heart attack should feel like. And then they end up dying or making it worse than what it really could be. And then same thing with tomatoes, fruit or vegetable. It just depends on what our prototype of a vegetable is. And here's just a nice pickup line for those of you that would like a pickup line. Okay, so just to review, we think by forming concepts and our definitions and prototypes help form our concepts. And we'll do some more examples of these in class tomorrow, but you want to make sure you know those two things. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about in this video are uh, different ways that we can problem solve. And there are four that I would like you to know. And in order to demonstrate those four problem solving strategies, we're going to use um, this problem as our example. So I have scrambled up a word and your job is to unscramble it. So I want you to go ahead and unscramble this word. And hopefully it doesn't take you too long, um, but the word is psychology. And so I'm sure you used one of these four ways to figure it out, but here are the four and how they would kind of relate to solving this word of psychology. So the first is trial and error. When you have a problem before you, one of the ways you can solve it is just by trial and error. And all trial and error is, is when you randomly do things to try and figure out an answer. There's really like no set strategy. You just got to start plugging, plugging things in, plugging away. So an example might be battleship. Okay. I have no idea where to start to, to move my pin or to ask you where your battleship is, but I just have to start somewhere and then I start to figure it out from there. That's kind of what you would do here with this scrambled word. You just start pulling some letters out and you try and figure out how they might go together. Another strategy is called an algorithm. And an algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure that guarantees a solution every single time. So it's kind of like a math formula. As long as you plug in the numbers correctly, you know you're going to get the answer correct every single time. The problem with algorithms, though, is that they can be very, very time-consuming and they're not always practical. So for example, if I tell you to go to the grocery store, and it's a new grocery store that you've never been to before, and I ask you to get the milk, more than likely the milk is going to be in the back. But if you use an algorithm to get to the milk, you would go up and down every single aisle in the grocery store to get to the milk because you know if you go up and down every single aisle, eventually you're going to find the milk. So it's going to get you the correct solution, but it might just take forever. If you use an algorithm for psychology here, and this scrambled word, it actually has 907,200 combinations. Um, so it would take you a really, really long time to use an algorithm to solve this word puzzle here. So an algorithm is not the best way of figuring it out, but it definitely is a problem solving strategy. And I want to show you a big bang clip right now that kind of demonstrates what an algorithm is. Just in time. I believe I've isolated the algorithm for making friends. <laughs> Sheldon, there is no algorithm for making friends. Well, well, hear him out. If he's really onto something, we could open a booth at Comic Con, make a fortune. <laughs> My initial approach to Kripke had the same deficiencies as those that plagued Stu the Cockatoo when he was new at the zoo. <laughs> Stu the Cockatoo? Yes. He's new at the zoo. <laughs> it's a terrific book. I've distilled its essence into a simple flow chart that will guide me through the process. Have you thought about putting him in a crate while you're out of the apartment? <laughs> Hello, Kripke. Yeah, Sheldon Cooper here. It occurred to me that you hadn't returned any of my calls because I hadn't offered any concrete suggestions for pursuing our friendship. Yeah, perhaps the two of us might share a meal together. Yeah, I see. Well, then perhaps you'd have time for a hot beverage. Popular choices include tea, coffee, cocoa. I see. No, 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 wait, don't hang up yet. But what about a recreational activity? I bet we share some common interests. You tell me an interest of yours. You, really? On actual horses? <laughs> tell me another interest of yours. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I have no desire to get in the water till I absolutely have to. <laughs> Another interest of yours. Uh oh, he's stuck in an infinite loop. I can fix it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But it's interesting, but isn't ventriloquism by definition a solo activity? <laughs> yeah. Wait, I mean, tell me another interest of yours. Hmm. Is there any chance you like monkeys? <laughs> yeah, what is wrong with you? Everybody likes monkeys. <laughs> Hang on, Kripke. A loop counter and an escape to the least objectionable activity. Howard, that's brilliant. I'm surprised you saw that. 
Gee, why can't Sheldon make friends? <laughs> All right, Kripke, that last interest strikes me as the least objectionable, and I would like to propose that we do that together tomorrow. Yes, I'll pay. <laughs> All right, goodbye. All right. Time to learn rock climbing. <laughs> The third strategy is called a heuristic, and a heuristic is like a mental shortcut to solving a problem. So um, if I ask you to go to the grocery store and get milk, and you've never been to that grocery store before, odds are that's going to be in the back. So rather than going up and down every single aisle like an algorithm would say, you just go straight to the back of the store as your best guess, and hopefully the milk is there. So the problem with heuristics are that they are error prone. They're not 100% like algorithms are. But the good thing about heuristics is that they can be a lot faster to solve problems than an algorithm. Um, so, for example, if we were going to like use this word, I'm scrambling it as an example, um, we know that there's very few words that have two Y's next to each other. So we can eliminate that option of words that would take some, some time away from the algorithm earlier. Um, eliminating vowels, or you know that you know certain letters in that word just don't really occur next to each other, like P's and G's are very rarely occurring next to each other. So that would be an example of heuristic. Another example of heuristics, if I showed you these two people and I said, go ahead and pick your babysitter. Um, based on whatever your life experiences are, you would have a, a gut feeling or a, a best guess about who would be a best babysitter. My assumption would be, be the old lady, but you just you never know. So each person has a little bit of different heuristics. And then the fourth strategy for problem solving is insight. And insight is when you just have no idea one second and then the next second, you know it. It just comes to you. It's like that aha moment it makes you really, really happy when you feel it. So um, a lot of times if you're staring at a word puzzle or, or um, a, a word problem of some kind, it just kind of comes to you. That's an example of insight. And what's interesting about insight is that animals also have insight, not just humans. And when you have an aha moment, you finally got something, you feel really great, and they show that um, the right temporal lobe is what, what's activated when you are experiencing insight. So that's where we're going to stop for today. Uh, you need to know those four different problem solving strategies and then also the difference between concepts and prototypes. And we'll go over those in class again tomorrow to kind of help you make sure you understand it. Um, now the answers for the brain teasers earlier. Um, the way that you solve the dot problem is you have to actually go outside of the figure in order to solve it. So a lot of times people don't think outside of the box, no pun intended, um, and then they're not able to solve it. But by extending the lines outside of the figure, then you are able to complete it in four moves. Um, without lifting your pen off the pencil or off the paper. Um, and then for the ball on the bat, the ball costs five cents. A lot of times um, the people will get this wrong thinking that the bat costs a dollar, but it can't cost a dollar because it's not 10 cents more than the ball. So anyway, the ball costs five cents and then the bat would cost a dollar five. And then adding those together would be a dollar ten. So we will see you tomorrow.